the world's largest log cabin, was located in Portland, Oregon, United States. So I came across these images that I'm projecting right now of this log cabin that existed in the 20th century. So what I want to do is just explore a little bit into this log cabin and seek out answers to some of my questions that I have with this log cabin. Also known as the forestry building, I found out that it was built for the Lewis and Clark Centennial Exposition held between the dates June the 1st, 1905 to October the 14th. Again, we come across another exposition that that seemingly throughout and across the world during the 19th and 20th century seemed to be completely abundantly full of them. So here's some images of this exposition. And really the highlight of it is this world's largest cabin. According to Wikipedia, it also numbers that it was approximately 2.5 million people that attended this exposition.
I only found two photos of the construction of this gigantic building, which dated back to 1904, which meant that they built this in one year for the opening in 1905. I'll let you decide whether that is suspicious or not that they built such a big and huge structure in such a small amount of time. Also as well, whether if these images of the construction are somehow photoshopped, faked or tampered in a way. Just something to keep in mind. Oregon lost world's biggest log cabin in spectacular 1964 fire. Here we go. When the sun came up on the morning of August 17, 1964, Oregon was home of the world's largest log cabin. When the sun went down that evening, it wasn't, and firefighters were still battling a blaze that sent flames ten stories into the air and rained burning embers the size of apples down on neighboring houses' roofs. It was the granddaddy of all fires in this historic area of Portland, local photographer and graphic designer Grant Kelton later wrote. I don't think I'll ever see anything like it again. The cabin was the last surviving building from the 1905 Lewis and Clark Exposition in Portland, and it sat across the road from Montgomery Park in the northwest section of town. It was an enormous structure, measuring 206 by 102 feet, just shy of half an acre. A full million board feet of lumber went into it. Portland timber magnate Simon Benson, the fellow who installed the famous Benson Bubbler drinking fountains in downtown Portland, supplied most of the logs for the structure, and they were hand-picked old-growth monsters from Columbia County. There was a colonnade down the middle of the building made of 52 unpeeled, six-foot-thick tree trunks, hand-matched like a string of pearls. They had to be handled specially when they were cut and hauled to preserve the bark. After the 1905 exposition, the building was purchased by the city of Portland, which for many years let it decline and decay. It was nearly lost to fire several times when embers fell on the roof either from nearby building fires or from wood stove embers, but quick responses by the fire department kept it going. In the 1940s, there was talk of actually demolishing the building, which by then had turned into a safety hazard. The balconies had been built with whole logs which had warped, making them dangerous, and the whole building was like a banquet hall for wood-destroying organisms like bark beetles and termites. Finally, in the 1950s, the Chamber of Commerce took up a collection to restore the place. By this time, people were starting to realize that it was completely irreplaceable. Old-growth timber like what had gone into its construction could still be found, but it was deeper in the forest and less uniform. Finding 52 matching trees would be prohibitively expensive, if not impossible, to do. And since the logs would have to be trucked to the site rather than just floated up the river, log handling systems would have to be engineered to prevent the bark from being scarred by the logging equipment. By the time of the state sesquicentennial celebration in 1959, the building was mostly restored to its former glory. It now boasted a, quote, priceless collection of logging and lumbering exhibits, both antique and modern, according to an Oregonian report. Also on display was another bit of history, the first sheet of commercially produced Douglas fir plywood ever made, a product of the Autzen family's Portland Manufacturing Company, produced in 1904. All of this went up in flames on what was surely the biggest and most spectacular single building structure fire in Portland history, and until the 1992 burning of the blimp hangar in Tillamook in Oregon history as well. On August 17, 1964, the Forestry Building's caretaker locked up for the night at about 5.30. Within 45 minutes, neighbors were noticing that something was wrong. Specifically, the place was on fire, and when the fire crews arrived at around 6.15, it was clear that nothing short of direct divine intervention was going to put it out. Quote, There was never a hope of saving the building, the Oregonian reported the next day. Nothing was saved from the inside. It turned out that the fire had been started by some bad vintage 1905 electrical wiring. Had it broken out an hour or so earlier, the caretaker might have seen it in time to raise the alarm and possibly save the building. But that's not what happened. The fire rapidly grew to spectacular proportions, and people flocked to the scene from all over Portland. 
Grant Kelton was a boy at the time, living about four blocks from the building. The flames were almost ten stories high. The fire illuminated the sky for miles. The neighborhood was an orange glow, he wrote on his website. The windows on the entire south side of the Montgomery Park building were blown out. The heat was so intense the windows were popping out. Glass was raining down to the street below. Ashes the size of large snowflakes fell to the ground within a mile of the structure. It was surreal, an amazing sight. Some of the spectators, the Oregonian reported, were in tears. Afterward, the city pulled itself together as best it could. Citizens and civic leaders got together with timber industry leaders to create the Western Forestry Institute to fill the void. The new institute soon had a new building, roughly the same size as the old one, in Washington Park, and generations of Northwest Oregon school children remember it from field trips to, quote, the Zoo, OMSI, and Forestry Center before OMSI, that is, the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, moved to its present location down by the river where the submarine is. So yes, they replaced what the building did, and we can be grateful for that. But they could never replace what the building was. What the building was was the cream of the Oregon timber crop in 1905, at the peak of an era when Oregon's timber was the finest and biggest and most amazing in the world, and there just isn't anything like it anymore. And there never will be. At least not for another 600 years or so, where we can grow another old-growth forest. <laughs>